word by that name. And we worship and serve this mighty God, Jesus, with all of our heart today. Praise God. And today, by the help of the Lord, I would want to continue. I don't know if I'm going to say finish, but I'll say continue. The series we've been preaching entitled The DNA of Apostolic Pentecostalism. And I could not complete a series on this subject without the subject today. And I'm going to, by the help of the Lord, preach today with all the sincerity, honesty, and humility I know. I'm not preaching against anyone today, but I'm preaching for someone. I'm thankful for every sincere, honest, hearted Christian alive in the world today. Here at the Life Church, starting with me, first of all, we take absolutely nothing away from anyone's faith in God, obedience to God's word. We celebrate, we celebrate faith, we celebrate obedience. But just open up your heart today and see if God might have a further revelation for you. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3, 13, 8 rather, he said, for we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Everybody say, for the truth. Amen. Every Christian is for the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So just let me be the pastor of the Life Church today and preach the Bible. If I say something you've never heard before, if you're not sure if you believe it or not, just listen, open up your heart, pray about it, synthesize it in your spirit, come to the altar, let God talk to you. That's why we come to church to hear from the Lord, amen. Praise God. 1 Timothy chapter 3 is the text today, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, everybody say there's no argument. That's what that word means. And without argument, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, Received up into glory. Once again, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Just say that last phrase with me, would you? Starting with God. God was manifest in the flesh. Say it again. God was manifest in the flesh. Say it one more time. God was manifest in the flesh. And I want to speak to you. By the help of the Lord on this subject, the DNA of apostolic Pentecostalism, God was manifest in the flesh. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I would like to read Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. The, King, the New King James says, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your might. And I suggest to you, hearers of the word today, this verse is foundational. Deuteronomy 6, 4 is not a peripheral verse, and really there's no such thing as a peripheral verse, but when it comes to fundamental doctrine of the Bible, when it comes to the foundation of God's Word, when you want to get down to the underpinnings, the things that hold up the Word of God, the things that, that everything else stands on, it, there can be no greater verse, no greater revelation no greater fundamental scripture in all the Bible than Isaiah, than uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In fact, when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? This is what he said. 
the Lord our God is one. There are a lot of things God could have said about himself right here in these Ten Commandments. Don't you agree? There are a lot of things that God could have said beside the Lord our God is one. He could have said the Lord our God is good. He could have said the Lord our God is mighty. He could have said the Lord our God is eternal. If, if he really wanted to, he could have said a plurality of persons with distinct consciences operating as one. But he didn't say that. He could have said it. But if that's what he was, why wouldn't he have clearly wanted to establish in his people's minds from the beginning of that relationship who he was as to his personality? But here's what he said. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is. Amen. Why would God so dogmatically want his people to know a numerical value about himself. It's very simple. God's oneness was an outstanding counterculture revelation to Moses' generation because the people of that world did not worship just one God. They worshiped a plurality of gods. Moses' culture and even pre-Moses culture, they were pantheists. They were polytheists. They were everything but one God worshipers. They worshiped the sun God and the moon God and the river God. And not much has changed in the world today. So God was establishing immediately that worshiping anything other than him and him alone would be idolatry. The doctrine of God's oneness is deep in the DNA of apostolic Pentecostalism. So why is our doctrine of God, why is theology such a big deal? Let me tell you why your theology is a big deal. Let me tell you why it's important what you think about God. Your DNA, your spiritual DNA, and your genetic, your, your physical DNA will greatly influence your behavior. The Korean Airlines owns the dubious distinction of having had more plane crashes than any other commercial worldwide airlines. According to Malcolm Gladwell, the author of the book Outliers, he suggests that the reason for this tragic oddity is because of culture. The Korean culture is one of deference. In most cases, they discovered that when the pilot was in error, the co-pilot was aware of the pilot's mistake in judgment. But because of the Korean culture of being shy, timid, and non-confrontational, the co-pilot would say nothing to the pilot of his error, and planes would crash and lives would be lost. That is one simple explanation of the power of culture, the power of DNA. Your theology and my theology will influence how we think about God, how we feel about God, our relationship with God, which then in turn will influence our behavior. Amen. Your theology will influence your lifestyle. Amen. Israel fell into idolatry early on in their walk with God. I mean, they weren't already delivered from Egypt. And they make this golden calf and they worship this golden calf. But if you study your Bible, it was more than just working up a lather, dancing around a golden calf. It actually turned into, forgive me, it turned into an orgy. They fell into sexual sin. Because of their idolatry. Their theology was goofed up. Your theology will impact your prayer life. Some people are not really sure who to pray to. Some people are afraid that they're going to offend someone. If they don't cover all the bases. 
And then there are people who do not believe that they are utterly and literally dependent upon God for every single thing in their life, every breath they breathe, every blink of their eye, every beat of their heart, every thought of their mind. There are people today that think God is just some kind of a cosmic Santa Claus that shows up once a year when they're in a crisis, but they don't have a prayer life. My friend, if your theology of God is goofed up, you're not going to spend much time praying to Him and having a relationship with Him and talking to Him and feeling close and personal with Him. Not only that, your theology will impact your worship. It will impact your worship. If someone thinks that God is just a sideshow, if God is just a Sunday morning temporary distraction, if God is just a small God or God that hasn't done anything for anybody and that we're self-made people and we're just kind of going through religious motions, that kind of a theological concept of God will limit your worship. If you think God is a little two-bit peon, then you're not going to extravagantly worship Him. And if you don't think he's done anything for you lately, you're sure not going to get excited about serving him. <laughs> Amen. Everybody okay? Yeah. Amen. If, you're, if your theology of God is God is a tight-fisted, tight-lipped, tight wad. God that is not a giver and he's only a taker, then you're not going to be much of a giver. Who would want to give to a God who, that someone has a theology like that? But that's not the God that I serve. The God that I serve is a giver. Amen. The God that I serve is a lover. He's always giving away. He's always giving his power away. He's giving his resources away. Hallelujah. If your theology of God is that, well... God wouldn't send anybody to hell. The only people that are going to hell, as far as I know, is Adolf Hitler and Ted Bundy. And if, and if you just think that God, that, 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 that there's not a hell, that there's not judgment for anyone at the end of this life, then you're probably going to just live your life, or the person that believes that is probably just going to live their life any old way their flesh wants them to. But if you believe, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. If you believe that he is your creator and that one day you will go back to him and you will answer to him. If you believe that he's not only your creator, but he's also your savior. Amen. And that he's worthy of the energy and the passion and the devotion and the commitment of your life. Then you will have a different theology than a lot of people in this world. And you will have a prayer life and you will have a lifestyle that not honors God and you will want to give your life to God I say to you today if you believe in one God you will passionately live out your life for that one God if you believe in one God you will talk the way he wants you to talk if you believe in one God you will present your body as a living sacrifice the way he's asked you to if you believe in that one God you'll gladly bring your tithe and your offering which I didn't get because I was playing in the orchestra today you'll gladly give it to the Lord if you believe in one God you'll go in your closet and shut the door and have sweet communion with him. <laughs> Hallelujah. You cannot select your DNA. If you're born with it, it is what it is. And I got to tell you that if you've been born of the water and the spirit, if you've been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, evidenced by speaking with other tongues, you've got DNA in you. Hallelujah. It's down deep in your soul. You can never get away from it. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will lead and guide into all truth. So much of the doctrine, beliefs, and practices. I'm not against anybody today. But so much of the doctrine, beliefs, and practices of the historic church came from the history of that church and not from here. It's not in this DNA. Their DNA comes from the writers of church history. 
not from the writers of the Bible. For many Christians today, their doctrine of God did not develop from Scripture, but it was a much later theological evolution that slowly emerged hundreds of years after Scripture was written. Apostolic Pentecostals do not bring the presuppositions of the historic church writers to the text of the Scripture. We do not develop our theology from creeds and councils. But we go straight to the Word of God. We do not look at the Godhead through the lens of non-biblical writers. But we look at the Godhead through the lens of the Old Testament and the New Testament. I don't understand the notion that the so-called church fathers of the historic church understood God better than the patriarchs and the apostles did. Or that those historic writers were smarter and more theologically advanced than what they refer to as the primitive or the simple-minded Bible writers. It's offensive to me to call the apostles and prophets simple-minded and primitive because the Bible says we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. I cannot intellectually accept that church history knew and understood God better than the apostles did. That somehow Augustine and Origen and Justin Martyr were smarter and wiser and more suited to pontificate on the Godhead than Peter, James, and John were. Because they don't agree. Their doctrine of God was a development of Greek philosophy, which came much later after the writing of Scripture. The apostolic church and all of its doctrine is not built on the foundation of the so-called church fathers or the post-apostolic fathers. Ephesians 2.20 and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Everybody said amen. amen. Countless non-biblical doctrines have come from church history. If you ask Peter today how he enjoyed being the first pope. He wouldn't have a clue what you're talking about. Millions of people have slipped into eternity having received a baptismal formula that is not biblical, but it is an uninspired invention of man. Infant baptism is not biblical. Amen. Baptism was always by immersion, and it was always in the name of Jesus Christ in the Scripture. And there is no honest theological debate about it today. Amen. There's not one honest theologian today that disputes the fact that water baptism was not originally by immersion, and it was always in the name of Jesus, or in the name of the Lord, or in the name of the Lord Jesus. Where did the historic church get off track? Where do they start going down a wrong road? I'm preaching to you about the DNA. Amen. That is deeper than the historic church DNA. It goes all the way back to the beginning. It all goes all the way back to hero Israel. Other non-biblical practices in the DNA of the historic church like indulgences, purgatory, penance, confessionals, candle lighting, non-biblical terminologies like holy water, Predestination, clergy, laity, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, excommunication, ex cathedra, and not to mention a sordid and seedy past of corrupt corruption and a trail of blood of those who suffered martyrdom in the name of the church. Please understand my heart today. I'm not against anybody. I'm not, I'm not preaching against anyone. I'm preaching for someone. Amen. I'm not taking away anything from anybody. Amen. But somebody's got to walk into our lives and preach the truth to us. We got to take an honest look at history. Amen. We don't, we cannot swallow. Amen. History because it's tradition. Let me tell you what spirit it was that crucified Jesus Christ. It was religious tradition. It was spiritual tradition that crucified Jesus. And it's the same spirit that keeps people locked up and from receiving revelation. And I've come to unlock the door today. I've come to let somebody out today. I've come to give somebody a revelation of who Jesus is. Mm. Hallelujah. None of these 
things that I've mentioned are in the DNA of apostolic Pentecostalism. Here's the difference. We don't sell indulgences, which was a piece of paper sold as a license to sin and hopefully spring some soul out of purgatory. We don't confess our sins to a man, but we go back to the Bible and we take our sins directly to the only one that can forgive us of our sins, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no purgatory. There are no second chances after this life. You can't give enough offerings after a deceased person's eternal status is locked in. There is a hell that is intended for the devil and his angels, and a lake of fire will also be their eternal abode of those who do not obey the gospel of of Jesus Christ the closest thing to holy water in the New Testament Bible is not a community finger bowl of water but it is a baptismal tank our water is not holy but what happens in the water when a person goes down and baptized in Jesus name is they get their sins remitted how holy is that The doctrine of predestination is not in our DNA. God is not up in heaven flipping a coin every time someone's born. Heads they go to heaven, tails they go to hell. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I'm the one that chooses whether I'm going to cooperate with the grace of God who said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, that he feared that after he had preached to others, that he himself would become a castaway. The terms clergy and laity are not in our DNA. I get a clergy sticker every year from our licensing office, and I've never put one on my car. Because I don't believe in the term clergy. Because it's not Bible. Amen. It's not, I said it's not Bible. Amen. The term clergy means learned. It means educated. And laity means stupid, ignorant, unlearned. In fact, one derivative of the word laity actually refers to a crippled limb. And this is what the historic church gave us. They gave us this big gap, this big gulf between the so-called clergy and the little peon laity. But in the beginning, it was not so. The apostles were among equals. Even though they had authority and government in the church, yet they empowered and raised up men like Stephen who were equally as powerful. And Philip, who preached in Samaria, and all the city had great joy. And there were miracles and wonders and signs. I understand spiritual authority. And thank you for the respect that you have for the pastor of this church. But I'm here to tell you, my friend, there's power out there. There's power in those seats. There's power in believing. There's power in honoring God's holy word. Praise God. Turn to somebody and say, I'm okay. Are you okay? Hallelujah. Amen. The true apostolic Pentecostal church does not have a trail of blood for martyrdoms committed at their hands. The apostles never persecuted anyone, but they themselves were the persecuted. The only trail of blood in our DNA is a trail that leads to Calvary. The trail of blood of those through the centuries who have laid down their lives for the gospel. Praise God. Whereas the term God the Father is a good biblical term, God the Son is not. It is not a biblical concept. The term God the Son, ostensibly referring to Jesus Christ, makes Jesus something other than what he was. He was not a person other than God, nor is he a second person of God manifest in flesh. There's no Bible language for that. Jesus Christ was God manifested in the flesh not just a person of God manifested in the flesh but God manifested in the flesh read your Bible Colossians 119 for it pleased the Father that in him Jesus should all the fullness dwell amen Jesus was not in the Godhead but the Godhead was in Jesus hallelujah <laughs> 
first, second, and third person language is not biblical language. It has nothing to do with the God of the Bible. Bible language is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. No apostle or disciple ever called Jesus God the Son. No apostle or disciple ever referred to the Holy Spirit as a person. The Holy Spirit is not a person. It is simply the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is God in action. The Holy Spirit is God in activity. Hallelujah. Genesis 1, 2. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. In fact, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I might really be messing up theology right now. But the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. John 14, 16. And I will pray the Father. And He will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because neither does it see him or know him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. And then he solved the puzzle. He said, I will not leave you like orphans, but I will come to you. When you get the Holy Ghost, you get Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We do not deny the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. They are all manifestations of one God. And Jesus was the physical, fleshly, visible manifestation of that one God. Oh, I got book. I got book today. Hallelujah. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. The language is literally the Lord of me and the God of me. Peter called him on his, in his message on the day of Pentecost. He called him both Lord and Christ. Isaiah said in chapter 9, verse 6, Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Is there any doubt who's that referring to? And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful. Listen, he's talking about the baby in Bethlehem. He's talking about the one that came and wrapped himself in flesh. His name shall be called wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Oh, I could just shout on that one a little bit. The mighty God. Hallelujah. John 14, 8, Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father. You're always talking about the Father. Show us the Father and then we'll be good. Now, there were a lot of things Jesus could have said right there to Philip's question. He could have said, I'm not the Father. He could have said, the Father is another person other than me. He could have said, the Father is an old man with a beard. And we are two completely separate persons. But Jesus said in verse 9, Have I been so long time with you, and yet you have not known me? Philip is saying, I want to know the Father. And Jesus said, Have you not known me? A grammatical reference to the Father. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now think about that. My wife and I, the lovely, the gracious, the vivacious, the beautiful Marlene. My wife and I may be one flesh, one in parenting, one in love, and one in ministry. But I cannot say, if you've seen my wife... You've seen me. But Jesus could say it because in John chapter 10, verse 30, he said, I and my father are one. Oh, hallelujah. Let me tell you who Jesus is. Let me tell you who Jesus is. This is the greatest truth. This is the greatest revelation. This is the doctrine on which all of the Bible stands. Now, I... I I know what somebody might be asking today. Why did Jesus refer to the Father at times as someone other than himself? I'm so glad you asked that very smart question. 
Philippians chapter 2 verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Another translation says that he considered being equal with God not a thing to be grasped. Everybody go like this. This is very powerful. Jesus was a man. And when he referred to the Father, he was not referring to another person. He was referring to the eternal Spirit of God. The God who said, I will share my glory with no other. And when Satan said to Adam and Eve, if you eat this fruit, you can grasp for the glory of God. You can be like God and your eyes will be opened. And they ate the fruit and man fell. And Jesus Christ, the Bible calls him the second Adam. He came to right the wrong of the first Adam. Jesus had to theologically answer to Adam's failure. And he refused to grasp for the glory of God. His flesh would not glory in the eternal spirit of God. And so he had to refer to the Father as someone other than himself. Listen, but here's what Jesus said about that in John 16, 25. He said, these things have I spoken to you. If you read John 16, he's talking about the Father. He said, these things have I spoken to you in Proverbs. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I will show you plainly of the Father. The word Proverbs means fictitious language. Let that sink in. Jesus saying, when I talk about the Father, it's pro proverbial language. It's not literal language. It's not talking about persons. I'm giving honor to the eternal spirit that overshadowed Mary. And while I'm on it, who was the father of Jesus? One place... The Bible said what was born of her was of God. In another place, it said the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. The answer is it was just God. It was the eternal spirit of God. Amen. If the Holy Spirit, the person, overshadowed Jesus, then Jesus is not the son of the Father. He's the son of the Holy Spirit. The good news is you don't have to pick and choose because it's all the same person. It's all the same being. Jesus said, I'm speaking of the Father in proverbial language, but he said the day will come when I will not speak in, fict in fictitious language. There's going to come a day, my friends, when he will not have to speak of the Father as someone other than himself. Amen. That day will come when the mediator role of Jesus Christ is over. When he doesn't have to fulfill the role of the sonship anymore. When the last soul is saved. When the last sin is forgiven. When the last soul is baptized in his name. When the last soul is filled with the Holy Ghost. When the last enemy is put under his feet. That day hasn't come yet. Psalm 110, 1, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit down my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. I think this is the most quoted verse from the Old Testament, quoted in the New Testament. Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Somebody said, well, see, he's at the right hand. Well, let me ask you a question. Does God have a right hand? How could he have a right hand if he's flesh, a spirit? God is a spirit. David said, under his wings I will trust. God doesn't have wings. He's not a chicken. It's a, it's a Hebrew idiom. It's a word picture. Everybody understood how a mother would gather her wings. Everybody understood how the chicks would run under, not gather her wings, gather her chicks. Praise God. God doesn't have a right hand. The, roar, the phrase right hand is a Hebrew figure of speech that means a place of power and authority. So let me ask you a question. When Jesus Christ, amen, when the last soul is saved and Calvary's work has done it all and Jesus is at the right hand place, but there's an until coming. I will put you at my right hand until I make my foes my footstool. If Jesus is going to be promoted and the promotion is imminent, where is the only place he can go from the right hand place? I'll tell you. Revelation 4, 2, and immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven 
and one sat on the throne. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, amen, there's going to come a day when Jesus Christ is not going to be at the right-hand place mediating, making intercession for us, saving souls, redeeming lives, defeating the devil, overcoming this world. There's going to come a day when that's all going to be over and he is going to have a, a promotion as it were and the world is going to look at him and every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. First Timothy 6.15, First Timothy 6.15, which in times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's lift our hands and worship him right now, shall we? Come on, somebody let your voice out right now. Hallelujah. 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 Let me tell you who Jesus is. The writings and influence of Greek philosophers like Philo prevailed upon the minds of the post-biblical theologians. Greek pagan philosophers influenced church theologians like Origen, Justin, and Augustine. Philo was a contemporary with Jesus Christ, although they never met. He lived in Alexandria. He taught that God was impassable, that God was the unmoved mover who could not transcend to earth or come to man. So he created the so-called, Philo created the so-called Logos theology to make Jesus Christ someone other than God. But let me tell you what the Bible says about that. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. To wit, that God was in Christ. Reconciling the world to who? God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not to another, not reconciling the world to some impassable, unreachable, untouchable person, but reconciling the world unto himself. Colossians 2, 9, for in him, meaning Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Acts 20, 28, Paul said, feed the flock of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. God did not send somebody else to save us. God did not send somebody else to die for us. He purchased us with his own blood. <laughs> Hallelujah. The mystery of godliness has nothing to do with a multiplicity of personalities in the Godhead. We can't just throw up our hands and say, well, I know three are one, but I don't understand it. Jesus is not in the Godhead, but the Godhead is in Jesus. The mystery is not about persons. The mystery is how did he do it and why did he do it and why would he do it? The old song says, oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Praise God. We've got one God DNA in our souls. It's the one God DNA that was down in the Jewish people who gave us the Bible. Ask any true Orthodox Jew today who believes in Torah, who God is. And admittedly, as a nation, they're blinded to see Jesus as the Messiah right now. But they're not always going to be blinded. But they will tell you that God is one. Acts chapter 9, the apostle Paul has letters in his hands. He's going to threaten and put in jail the disciples of Jesus Christ. And he's on his way to Damascus and a light shines down from heaven brighter than the new day sun. And it knocks him to the ground and he's on the ground and he's staggering and he's, and he's trembling. And a voice says, Saul, Saul, thou persecutest me. And Saul's blinded and he says, who are you, Lord? Now it took a lot of guts to ask that question. You got to understand this. Saul is a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He's a Hebrew of the Hebrew. He is so one God, he only keeps one bottle of milk at a time in his refrigerator. He would not accept anything else but one God. And this Jesus was an imposter. He did not see the Messiah like the flesh that Jesus came in, it wasn't in his paradigm. And he says, who are you, Lord? And he's trembling. Saul's thinking, oh, no, I don't know if I'm going to like this answer or not. I might have to give up my day job. <laughs> yeah. 
And the Lord said, I am Jesus. There's a lot of things Jesus could have said right there. If he was not the one true and living God. Come on somebody. There's a lot of things he could have said right there. He was saying Saul. You served me in the Old Testament paradigm. You thought you were righteous persecuting these people. You thought Jesus was an imposter. You thought he was a lunatic or some kind of a liar. But I am the Jehovah of the Old Testament. I am manifested in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Somebody said, well, what about Stephen? Stephen was being stoned. He's the first Christian martyr. And they stoned Stephen. The Bible says, Stephen said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. I've already talked to you about that. They, verse 57 of Acts 7, they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran on him and cast him out of the city. And they're stoning him with stones. And verse 59, they stoned Stephen, calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So let me wrap up. This message. Man, I've worked myself all up in the lathers. Anybody believe what I'm preaching today? <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. I want to ask you a question. Why was Jesus crucified? I can tell you it was not because he claimed to be God the Son. I can tell you it was not because he claimed to be a person of the Godhead that he was crucified those Jewish one God monotheistic people would have dismissed him like they'd done hundreds of others and never demanded their crucifixion but he was crucified because he claimed to be the physical manifestation of the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob Jesus said before Abraham was I am John 10, 32, Jesus answered, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. Of which of those works do you stone me? The Jews said, For a good work we stone you not, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. They really didn't get it right. He really wasn't a man making himself God, but he actually was God who'd made himself a man. John 19, 7, the Jews answered him, We have a law according to our law. He ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. They did not say God the Son, but they said Son of God. Obviously, he was a son because he was born in flesh. But not the eternal, eternally begotten Son. That's not possible. God said, Thou art my beloved Son, this day have I begotten thee. Amen. There is no such thing as a co-equality or a co-eternality in the persons of God. If Jesus Christ is the begotten Son of God and God said, This day have I begotten thee. I'll tell you what day it was. It was the day that the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary and that which was conceived of her was of God. Hallelujah. Son of God is a reference to flesh, to birth. It's incarnational language. It's covenant language. It's manifestation language. It's flesh of God language. Amen. Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God. Whew. Man. Jesus Christ is the only physical manifestation that human eyes have ever beheld of God. I want you to stand with me. Isaiah 9, 6. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. And the Prince of Peace. Let me tell you who Jesus is. Let me tell you who Jesus is. He's the God of the Old Testament. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob manifested in the flesh. This is why Jesus could say, Philip, how is it I've been so long with you? And you say, show me the Father. 
If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When Jesus said, the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works, it's his flesh. In his flesh, he could do nothing. But the eternal spirit of God was in him. It would almost be like one of these spotlights. If I was to turn on all the lights and turn on one light, it would illuminate this entire room. And yet it would be focused out of that one source. Jesus Christ was God's source. God's headquarters, if you will. And his spirit emanating and radiating out into all the world. And I want to tell you, my friend, Jesus Christ wants to be revealed in this world. This message has got to get out. This message is liberating. This message is freeing. I have a friend right now. He pastors in Waseca, Minnesota. His name is Tim Peterson. And him and his wife were pastors for years. And they really didn't know who Jesus was. And they got this revelation of the mighty God in Christ. And they sat in their living room. And they wept, thinking that they had served him all these years and they didn't know who he was. Are you thankful that you know who Jesus is? Come on, are you thankful you know who Jesus is? Hallelujah! 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 Praise God! This is the greatest truth. This is the greatest revelation. Amen. This is the revelation on which all other revelation stems from God's holy word. I want to just invite you to come and stand around this altar right now. And we're going to lift our hands and we're going to worship the one true and living God. And I want to tell you that this God, this one God that we serve, separates us from every other worshiper in the world. People that are worshiping a plurality. People that are worshiping idols. People that are worshiping devils. People that are worshiping demons. This is the greatest truth in all the world. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Let's lift our hands. Let's set our voices out. Let's worship Jesus Christ. Let's worship Jesus Christ. Let's worship Jesus Christ. Let's worship Jesus Christ.